be invited here this morning and especially during this time of mission here at the church and at the tent and we have been praying that God will richly bless his servant Pastor George. This morning I'm asking you please to open your Bible with me in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and we're going to break into the chapter at verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. The writer writes, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the, of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul is enumerating for us many of the afflictions that he passed through, how he was beaten of rods and suffered nakedness and hunger, was left in the deep and... Uh, and all the persecutions that he passed through. So when he comes to chapter 12 and verse 1, he begins, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. For such a one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. And amen, God always blesses to us the reading of his sacred word. Before I left Banbridge Baptist Church, where I was there as 11 years as pastor, I was invited one day to the high school. We had a very good relationship with the high school, and I was there quite frequently. But on this occasion, they were marking the 50th anniversary of the high school in Banbridge. And for that 50th anniversary, while there was a little ceremony, they were planting a tree and I had to do the religious part of reading and praying. And then at the end of the ceremony, there was a man there who had a large casket, and he opened the casket, and out flew 50 doves, 50 doves to mark the 50 years of the high school in Banbridge. These doves, they flew around the school twice, and, and then they flew off. I was so taken with them, I spoke to the man who was closing up his casket, and I I asked him, what about the doves? Where did you get? He said, well, they're not really doves. They're homing pigeons, white homing pigeons. He says, I live in Dromore, and they'll be in Dromore before I am in Dromore. I said, are you kept busy with them? Busy? He said, just last Saturday, I had seven different engagements with my pigeons. He says, we do births and funerals. We do uh, christenings and special occasions. He says, we're ever so busy. I thought to myself, that would be a good one for, for retirement. I mean, the birds do all the flying. He's just there to pick up the money, and they do the work. 
I mentioned that to you this morning because when he spoke of homing pigeons, it reminds me, my friend, that if you're a Christian this morning, you've received the heavenly dove within your heart. The Bible tells us that when Noah uh, opened the ark and he let go the dove, the dove returned because it couldn't find a place that was dry for its foot. The second time he released the dove, the dove didn't return. Why? Because the ark had landed, the earth was, was dry, and therefore the, the dove didn't return. That is until the day when our blessed Lord Jesus was baptized. And the Bible tells us that on that occasion, as Jesus went down into the Jordan, while the heavens opened and the voice of the Father was heard saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended from heaven as a dove coming into the life and heart of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. I say this morning that if you're a Christian, you've got the heavenly dove within your heart. And that's that heavenly dove that I say to you gives to us that sense of home. The Bible reminds us this morning, you're speaking of a tent out at Cranfield, why the Bible reminds us that if this earthly tent be dissolved, we have a house, we have a home eternal in the heavens. We used to sing the hymn, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. It's on heaven's shore. That is our heavenly home. And I say to you this morning, my friend, if you're a Christian, thank God that heavenly dove within our heart gives to us that homing sense. That is why the Apostle Paul said those words, that I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Why? Because he had a longing to go home. He was heaven-bound. We were reading of Abraham here this morning. We read of Abraham. Although he was a rich man, he never built any houses here on earth. All he built were tents. And why? Because here on earth he was a sojourner. He was just passing through. As a matter of fact, the Bible says of him that he on earth was a pilgrim and a stranger. Here he had no continuing city. He dwelt in tabernacles. Tents were his home. When he died, he didn't leave a, a building behind. He left a, a, he left a tent to his son. And why? Because the Bible says... He was looking for a city. He was looking for the city whose builder and maker was God. The Bible tells us of the heirs of Abraham, that if they desired a country, they might have returned to the country from which they came. But now they were looking for a better country. My friend, can I say, that country is heaven. That home is heaven itself. The Bible tells me, my friend, that if you're a Christian, you are nearer to heaven than you've ever been in your life before. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Philippians, said that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It is to be at home with the Lord. It is true, as the Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, that God has made all things beautiful in his time, and he has put eternity in our hearts. Isn't that an amazing thing this morning? that here our life on earth is but a temporary thing. We are passing through, just as Abraham was passing through. We are sojourners. But God has put the sense of eternity in our hearts. That's why Muslims speak of, of paradise in their misguided uh, way of thinking about it. That is why Hindus speak of karma. They think of reincarnation. That is why animists in the heart of the jungle, as we've seen them, they, they believe in an afterlife. Why? Because God has put that consciousness, not only of God, the Creator, but the consciousness of eternity in our hearts. Thank God we know what that eternity is for a Christian. If you're a Christian this morning, the greatest moment of your Christian life has not happened yet. The greatest moment of your Christian life will be when you see Jesus face to face. What a moment that is going to be, my friend, on that day when we see the Savior. If you're not a Christian this morning, the most horrific day of your life has not happened yet. To depart and to be without Christ. Listen, to live without Christ is a hopeless life. 
To die without Christ is a lost eternity. And to waken up in that place called hell, the place of torments, the bottomless pit, the darkness, and it's forever and ever and ever. My friend, I tell you this this morning, the thought of hell puts a shiver in the spine. But the thought of heaven, thank God it puts joy and a song on our lips. It is this blessed hope of which the Bible speaks as the living hope because Jesus is alive. It is this hope that gives to us a song even in our sorrow. It is this blessed hope that wipes away our tears and helps us see the clear vision of our soon coming Lord Jesus. And the Bible says that when he comes, so we shall be forever, forever with the Lord. Now, if the Bible says all that about heaven, then heaven, may I just remind you, in the Bible has got many names. It is called paradise because of its beauty. It is called a city because of its population. It is called the kingdom because, my friend, of the legal king that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It is called a bride. Isn't that amazing? Uh, when John saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, he said, it was like a bride adorned to meet the groom. It was the epitome of beauty. Uh, in 57 years of Christian ministry, I've done a lot of weddings. I've never seen an ugly bride. Isn't that amazing? Every bride is, maybe some have come near to it sometimes, but I've never seen an ugly bride. Uh, uh, the bride is beautiful. And so for John to describe the epitome of beauty, when he saw heaven, he said, it's like a bride adorned to meet the groom. Oh, what a beauty heaven is, a city. It's called the Beulah Land, my friend. But best of all, can I say to you, it is called the Father's house and our heavenly home. If that's the case this morning, just for these few moments, I'd like us to, to think of heaven. Uh, first of all, let us think of heaven's location. Where is heaven? Everybody would like to know where heaven is. The Bible tells me, my friend, that the Apostle Paul here, he said he was caught up onto the third heaven. When we look outside and we look up into the sky, sometimes we see it gray and sometimes we see it blue, we are looking at the atmospheric heaven. It is a reflection of light on the atmosphere that encircles our planet. It is the atmospheric heaven. However, when you go out at night and go into those morns and look up where light has not polluted the darkness, then you can see the stellar heavens. You can see the planets and the stars. And my friend, it reminds us of how great our God is, the immensity of this universe. But the Bible tells us that while the first heaven may be the atmospheric heaven and the second heaven may be the stellar heaven, thank God the third heaven is God's home. It is the paradise of God. That's what the Apostle Paul says. He was caught up into heaven, in the paradise itself. When we speak of the atmospheric heaven, we know that the atmospheric heaven, why we use it today for travel. You can travel by aeroplane in the atmospheric heaven. When we speak of the stellar heaven that we see at night time, now they've invented rockets that are able to not only encircle our planet, but explore out into the universe. But can I say that to get to the third heaven, it is only through Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father by me. There is no invention of man, my friend, that will ever get you to the third heaven. There is nothing that you can conjecture with in your life that will open up the way from heaven. Jesus said, he is not only the way, but he is the only way to heaven. We're living in a day of syncretism when many people want to blend all of the religions. They'll take Hinduism and Islam and Christianity of a form, and they will try to blend it all together and say that we have got many different labels, but all the ways lead to heaven. And they illustrate it by saying, if heaven, for example, is New York, you can travel from Dublin with Aer Lingus, you can travel from London with British Airways, if they're not in strike, you can travel with, with Air France from Paris, you can travel with Lufthansa from Berlin, but while you go on all different labels, all labels will take you to New York, and therefore that's just like heaven. The problem with that is we're not traveling to New York, we're traveling to heaven. 
And Jesus said, it is the Father's house. And Jesus said, there is no other way but through him. Therefore, he said, ye believe in God, believe also in me. He gave to us a simple faith. He gave to us a secure future. And the sure foundation is Jesus Christ himself. Where is heaven? Heaven, my friend, is the third heaven. Uh, by day, we can see the, the beauty of the atmospheric heaven. We love to see the blue skies. At nighttime, we can look up and see the beauty of the stellar heaven, the universe all around us. But the third heaven, you cannot see it with the naked eye, but thank God you can see it by faith. The Bible tells us here that Abraham, he looked for a city. He could see the city. The Bible tells us here of these heavenly pilgrims that they uh, had seen the, the promise of far off. They were looking. May I just remind you that's exactly how we are to run our race. The Bible tells us, my friend, that we are to run this race looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It is exactly this that the Apostle Paul spoke of when he said these words, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. Christian this morning, are you looking for the coming Christ, the location of heaven? Now, the Bible tells us of the location of heaven. For example, it says of, of the Lord Jesus that he was taken up into heaven. The angel said to the disciples, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing all the day up into heaven? This same Jesus whom you see, who you have seen ascend up into heaven, will so come in like manner as you have seen him go. That is, Jesus went up. The Bible tells us of Stephen. When he was being stoned, his face shone like an angel. And from that dungeon, that hole in the ground, he looked up. And he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. But the emphasis was up. But now the intelligent people here amongst us will say, well, that is fine for us. But what about the people in Australia? I mean, when they look up, they're looking down. Is that not the case? My friend, can I say this morning, there are some commentators, incidentally, who, who will go to Psalm 75. And Psalm 75 reminds us, and especially in this election week, that promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west or from the south, but promotion comes from God. The fact that in those dimensions it doesn't mention the north, some commentators tend to think that heaven is to the north. My friend, can I say, heaven is where Jesus is. Uh, heaven, my friend, it encompasses our universe. It is where Jesus is. That is the third heaven, the location of heaven. However, the Bible not only tells us something of the location of heaven, the Bible tells us a lot about the population of heaven. You remember our Lord Jesus? The Bible tells us that he came from the Father and he returns to the Father. The Lord Jesus, when he spoke of heaven, he spoke of it as the Father's house. Remember the prayer that he taught us, Our Father which art in heaven, it is the home of the Father. It is the place where Jesus is. The Bible tells us that it was from heaven that God sent forth his Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, we quoted already this morning, the Holy Spirit descended out of heaven as a heavenly dove. It is his heavenly home. Therefore, heaven is the home of the divine trinity. Heaven also is the home of holy angels. There were disobedient angels over there in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 14, Lucifer who said he would exalt himself above God and, and take the place of God, but God cast him down into the depths. So that is Lucifer and those disobedient angels. But I just remind you that there are myriads, millions of God's angels. Psalm 103 tells us that the angels of God are as a burning light, ministering unto him day and night. And my friend, while we cannot see around us, let's remember this, that while the prince of this world is busy, that is the devil, thank God God's angels are doing their work. It is said of Mr. Spurgeon one day that crossing a road in London, he tripped and fell, and just within a carriage almost ran over his head, but stopped, miraculously stopped in time. And someone said to him in the vernacular of the day, Mr. Mr. Spurgeon, you were lucky. He said, no, God's angels do their work well. 
Aren't you glad that Psalm 91 reminds us that the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him? Why, he has given his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. God's holy angels are serving him. It is their heavenly home. The Bible tells us that heaven is the home of just men made perfect. We have been reading of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Just as we look back to Calvary, they were looking forward to Calvary. My friend, they also were made perfect through the blood of Jesus. While it is true that they built altars and they had offered lambs and made sacrifices, but they knew that all the blood of those sacrifices could never wash away their sin. They were looking for the coming Messiah. And the Bible tells me, my friend, that many shall come from the east and the west, and they shall sit down with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. The Bible tells me in Matthew chapter 17 that Moses and Elijah, they came from heaven to meet with Jesus. Why, heaven is the home of those Old Testament patriarchs and prophets, the spirits of just men made perfect. But can I say that heaven is the home of the redeemed? Over there in Revelation chapter 7, the question is asked, who are these who have come out of great tribulation? And the answer is given. These are they who have washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. My friend, if you're a Christian this morning, can I say that you're a Christian because of the blood of Jesus Christ? You're a Christian because Christ died for our sins, and you are one who has washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And thank God this morning. Listen to what the Bible says. We are accepted in the Beloved in whom we have redemption through His blood and the forgiveness of our sin. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1 that He has begotten us again unto a lively hope. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, those who are kept by the power of God unto salvation, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away. Listen to it. Reserved in heaven for you. You're a Christian this morning. Thank God you're bound for glory. We're heaven bound. That's why we have this sense of heaven in our hearts. Therefore, heaven, I say to you this morning, is the home of the Trinity, the home of angels, the home of just men made perfect, the home of the redeemed. And one day, my friend, we're going to blend our voices with those of whom the Bible says in Revelation chapter 5, 10,000 times 10,000. They will see not only the Lion of the tribe of Judah, but they will see the Lamb of God. And they will blend their voices and sing, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Of course, when we speak of the population of heaven, a lot of people have questions about it. Will I recognize anyone in heaven? Well, of course you will. I mean, if the Bible says they shall come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and with Isaac and Jacob, how will they know Abraham if they've never met him before? He will be recognized in heaven. My friend, can I say it is in heaven that we will know each other? This Bible tells me that in heaven we will know as we are known. You will know each other better than you've ever known them before. Now, when it comes to heavenly relationships, I cannot answer that question. The Bible doesn't tell us everything about heaven, but it does tell us everything we need to know about heaven. And that tells me, my friend, that we will know each other in heaven. I've said to Audrey, I'll meet her outside the eastern gate. I don't know who will arrive first, but I'll meet her inside the eastern gate, I should say. We will know each other in heaven. Uh, but the other question is, how will I appear in heaven? Well, a baby who dies and goes to heaven, will, will this baby appear as a baby in heaven? Or, or the old person who dies with all the wrinkles, will they appear wrinkled in heaven? No, my friend. The Bible tells us that they shall have a new body, a glorified body. This body, my friend, will be eternal. Think of that this morning. It means that in heaven they'll never need hospitals or cemeteries. We'll never need policemen. There will be policemen in heaven, but they'll not be doing their police work. There will be doctors and nurses in heaven, but they'll never work in a hospital. There will be undertakers in heaven, but they'll never dig any graves. Why? Because no sickness, no death, nothing that defileth ever enters into heaven. What a population that's going to be. Uh, how will we appear in heaven? Well, when 
when God made Adam and Eve in the garden, He didn't make two little babies. He made two full-grown people. Therefore, if God did that in the Garden of Eden, what is it going to be in the Eden above? My friend, He'll give to us glorified bodies. When I lived in Brazil on a Sunday afternoon, we would, we would uh, go out to the Leprosarium, a place called Aleixo. And there we would meet with these people in deformed limbs. Sometimes they had no hands, and other times they had no feet. And old Alberto, his face was scarred, and his, his sight was gone. And for 49 years, he sat there on a bed in the leprosarium. What a terrible state. But when we met with them, and, and we sang with them, when we read the Scriptures, why would touch your heart this morning? At the end of it, they'd sing, Maranatha, 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 or a vain Señor Jesus. They're singing, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Why? Because they know that this vile, weak body one day is going to be transformed to be like unto the glorious body and a brand new body that will be. Oh, the population of heaven! Let me ask you, are you bound there this morning? The location of heaven, the population of heaven. What about the occupation of heaven? What will we do in heaven? There are some people who think that in heaven we'll sit around in fluffy clouds and string harps all day long. Not so. Uh, other people who think that heaven is just going to be one continuous church service where we will sing, well, it's not day and night, but we will sing forever. Not so. Can you imagine what long continuous service for eternity? I suppose that depends on which church you attend, but, but can you imagine just one long service, all of it? No, my friend. The Bible tells us, listen to it, who are these who washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb? These are they who will serve Him day and night forever. My friend, heaven will be a place of service. We look back with gratitude and since 1961, when God enabled us to step out by faith and serve Him. Fifty-six years of Christian service. And as the old hymn says, the longer we serve Him, the sweeter He grows. But sometimes we grow weary in this service. Sometimes it's an uphill struggle in this service. Sometimes we get discouraged in this service. My friend, may I just remind you, when we get home, we will serve Him without limitation. What a day that's going to be. And I don't know what your service will be there, but I'll say this to you. We should be serving Him here. You see, heaven is not only a destination. Heaven is a motivation. In view of the fact that we're going home, my friend, it should motivate us, prompt us to serve Him better here. You'll serve Him in eternity. Uh, not only in heaven will we serve, in heaven we will sing. That is true. I've already said this morning, Revelation chapter 5, we will blend our voices and we will sing in that heavenly choir. And my friend, you who have never sung like a soprano, and I'm talking of the men, sorry, uh, of the ladies, uh, you who have never sung as sopranos and tenors and baritones, my friend, in that glorified body with a new voice, we will make heaven ring. As the old hymn says, holy angels will stand aside as they listen to the saints sing of the redemption story. We are going to sing in heaven. And I say to you this morning, that song shall have already begun within our hearts. We will, we will uh, serve him in heaven. We will sing in heaven. Do you know that in heaven we will shout? Now, over here in Northern Ireland, we don't get much shouting in Baptist meetings. But the Bible tells me over there in Revelation chapter 19 that four times the saints shout out, Hallelujah! 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 And why? Because the Lamb prevails. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 16. Last year I wrote a book for the Faith Mission. They were marking 1916 from the first Easter Convention. 1916 was a commemorative year in Ireland. Do I need to remind you, as they looked at, uh, not only for the revolution or rebellion, was it in Dublin, but the Battle of the Somme. They were looking at 1916. During that year, I like to look at Revelation 1916. Look at what it says. It says, and on his thigh was written these words, 
King of kings and Lord of lords. Is it any wonder they shout, Hallelujah? There will be shouting in heaven, service in heaven, singing in heaven, shouting in heaven. There will be silence in heaven. I think, my friend, the silence of heaven will be when we see Jesus. The Bible tells me in the book of the Revel, book 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. I'll tell you this, when we see Jesus, we will be awestruck. We will be awestruck face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? Oh, I tell you this this morning, the location of heaven, the population of heaven, the occupation of heaven, the acclamation of heaven, the acclamation of heaven is all about Jesus. My friend, can I say that he is the theme of heaven? His name is the music of heaven. His presence is the sweetness of heaven. It's all about him. Thank God we will worship him. You see, when we get to heaven, we will see those jasper walls and walk those streets of gold. We will see the garden city where the, the trees grow for the healing of the nations. We will see the, the river of crystal. But that will not be the acclamation of heaven. We want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. Incidentally, as a Christian, I do remember my friend Fred Orr, who is now with the Lord, when Fred's wife died, which is 63 years ago today, the 4th of June. She died on the 4th of June. When Ina Orr died, Fred was heartbroken, and you can understand that. And when he came home and he went to church, they were singing, I want to see my Savior, first of all. He, he felt hurt in his heart because he wanted to see the wife that he loved. But then as he read the Scriptures, he read these words, that on that day when Jesus comes, the dead shall be, will rise first, the dead in Christ. That would be Ina. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That is the living and the dead. We shall be caught up together with them, and together we, we will go to meet the Lord in the air. Isn't that just amazing? That means you'll meet your loved ones before we meet the Savior, and we will meet him together if you're a Christian. I have said all that this morning. The, popula the uh, location of heaven, the population of heaven, the occupation of heaven, the acclamation of heaven. Let me finish by asking about the preparation for heaven. Are you prepared? The book of Amos, chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Prepare to meet thy God. Uh, I remember doing a mission in the Arts Peninsula many years ago, and a girl trusted Christ the Savior, but she was on the Kegworth flight, and many of you will remember that Kegworth flight that came down, and 30-something people lost their lives. As the plane was landing, going to Christ's land, the Pilot gave the word out, prepare for an emergency. For those people, the word was, prepare for eternity. Are you prepared? If I was to offer you the choice of any one of four gifts, a new Ferrari, that sounds good, a check for 100,000 pounds, that's good, or better still, a brand new house, that sounds good. The fourth one would be a parachute. Incidentally, I forgot to tell you, we're in an aeroplane that's falling to the ground. Would you take the Ferrari? Would you take the check? Would you take the brand new house? Or from the plane, would you take the parachute? My friend, I tell you this this morning, the most important thing in life is to prepare for eternity. President Eisenhower, when he was in the White House, sent for Billy Graham one day. And to Billy Graham, he asked, Dr. Graham, can you tell me about heaven? What is it Jesus said about heaven? And so he quoted to him, 
John chapter 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. He went on to elaborate about heaven and perhaps cover some of the things we've covered here today. And at the end of it, President Eisenhower shook his hand and said, thank you, Dr. Green. But years later, when Eisenhower was dying in the John Hopkins Hospital in Washington, he sent again for Dr. Green. And Dr. Green came to the hospital room, and where he was, in that hospital room, President Eisenhower said, you remember, Dr. Green, you came to the White House, and you told me about heaven. Can you tell me about it again? And so he told him about the promise of Jesus and about the place that is prepared. And when they'd finished talking about heaven, President Eisenhower stretched forth his feeble hand and shook the hand of Billy Graham and said, Dr. Graham, I'm prepared. Are you? Come to Christ today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Reminds us of this blessed living hope that is ours, that because Jesus lives, he said that where I am, there ye will be also. Bless this word to every heart this morning, we pray, and give to each one of us to know that blessed assurance that Jesus is ours. So, our Father, we commend ourselves to Thee now and to Thy grace, and pray that the Lord Jesus may be uplifted and glorified in us. In His name we pray. Amen.